You're watching the Spirit Food Christian Center Worldwide Webcast, broadcasting live every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time. Yes, amen, hallelujah. When Spirit Food comes to you, blessings will flow. Say yes. Give Him the glory, the praise, the honor, the adoration, the worship. Repeat these words after me. I'm holding in my hand that which I'm holding in my heart, the holy written word of God. The Bible is God speaking to me. I am what the word of God says I am. I can do what the word of God says I can do. I have what the Word of God says I possess. I am a believer, not a doubter. Therefore, God's Word is being confirmed in my life with signs following. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for loving me. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated if you can. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Literally, we're here to receive from the Lord and to bless him according to his word. Today is Communion Sunday. It's a day in which we would acknowledge the table of the Lord. We're also here to continue teaching on the subject of the Christian family, and I know that I've been going in different parts of it, and then we get into a one place where we were talking about angels explicitly, but angels are not separate from the Christian family in the sense that we who believe on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we have angels that have been dispatched unto us. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. We who have faith in Christ Jesus... We are the family of God. And God has declared in his word that he has provided angels. They were created to minister for those who are heirs of salvation. And that's us. Say, I'm an heir of salvation. I'm an heir of salvation. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Hebrews chapter 1. And we'll let our little people go to their classes, I know. It's exciting for them to go to their classes, but they'd like to stay. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 1. Let's look at verse 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. God upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, referring to Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, who is the word of God, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, I'll circle the word inheritance because Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, has a name that was given unto him in an inheritance. And therefore, the name Jesus, if you have notes that you're taking, write down Jesus means, we pronounce it Yeshua in Hebrew, Jesus means God is our Savior. God is our Savior. So in verse 4 of Hebrews chapter 1, being made so much better than the angels, 
as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he will, shall be to me a son. Now let's look at verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son. That means God hadn't said that to any angels, and no angels are, are a son of God. This day have I begotten thee. Now this day that he's referring to is the day of the resurrection. When God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, he's referring here in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, it says, this day have I begotten thee. That means Jesus was raised from the dead, begotten of the Father. He's the first man, because he was not an angel. Jesus was a man. He was God the Son that had laid aside his inherent power and glory as being God the Son and became a man and suffered and went through the things that all men would go through in that Jesus being a man, was made sin with our sin. He didn't commit any sin, but he was the sacrificial lamb. He was the scapegoat. You've heard the term scapegoat, which means that the priests of the Old Testament under the Jewish family, they would take the goat and lay their hands on the goat and they would curse the goat and speak all of the transgressions of the people of Israel that were being confessed unto them as they would have the people to come in the temple and they would say, I need to talk to a priest. I'm going to offer up a sin offering. And they would give the people the opportunity to talk to them, confess their sin, and then offer up what was properly addressed according to the scriptures. But those sins that they confessed, those priests would take those sins that were confessed unto them that were put on the scapegoat. And when I say scapegoat, they, the priests would lay hands on the goat and they would allow the goat to be, as it were, the recipient of the curses of the people. Then they would take the goat up in the wilderness and they would let it go so that it would be destroyed by the beast. And that's where you get the term scapegoat. Now, why would they take it into the wilderness to be destroy the beast? Because the people would never see the goat again. The goat that was what? As a symbol of their transgressions. So Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, he was our scapegoat. He is what? He is our, the Lamb of God that has come to take away the sin of the world. The Lamb that was without spot or blemish or any such thing. The Lamb of God that was going to be offered up for the guilt of the people. The Lamb was innocent. But even though the Lamb was innocent, it would be offered up as if it were the committer of the crimes of the people. So the children of Israel, they recognized, when I talk about the children of Israel, before Jesus Christ offered, was offered up on the cross, the children of Israel were aware that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There wasn't anybody that kept the Ten Commandments perfectly because if you broke the law, one law, you were guilty of all the law. And what was the punishment for breaking the law? The punishment for breaking of the law is this. The wages of sin is death. So all of the nation of Israel that were comprised of people that made mistakes, how can they live? They could only live because they looked to what? They looked for the atonement of their sins, the ability to be considered as one with God because of the covering blood of the lamb and the consideration of the scapegoat that was being destroyed, not to remind them of their past mistakes. So when the scriptures identify Jesus Christ as being again called the Son of God, here we're looking at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. 
For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, the word again means Jesus who was innocent. Jesus who had never sinned. Jesus who walked in fellowship with the Father. And we have in Matthew the sixth chapter where it talks about our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jesus was always referring to God as his Father. He walked with his Father. He identified the Father as his Papa. He identified God the Father as his God. And that's why when he rose from the dead, he said, Mary, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my God, your God. I have not yet ascended to my Father, your Father. So Jesus is establishing this fact that, yes, the wages of sin is death. Yes, blood identifies the life of a person. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And if a person has blood in their body, then they have the capacity to what? They have the capacity to record the challenges of their sin. Jesus' blood was innocent. He never committed any sins. So his blood was the only blood that could pay the price for all of mankind's sins because he had never sinned. And because he never sinned, when his blood was shed and he was offered up as a sacrifice, Jesus' blood could redeem us from our sin. Now there's a difference between atone for sins and redeem or remit our sins. Atonement means to whitewash. Like you would take a wall that's been graffitied and, and uh, you take a whitewash paint and you put over it and what would happen? And what would happen is that the eventual graffiti would bleed through. But when you say something has been remitted or redeemed, all of the sin and the effects of sin have been eradicated by Jesus whose blood has redeemed us from our sin. We are not sinners saved by grace. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, our responsibility is to spend our lives finding about out how to walk in the highest and the most knowledgeable way of understanding God's love for us. He loves you. The Father loves you. You don't have to talk him into loving you. He already demonstrated his love for you. While we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for our sins. Now, why does it say, again, you shall be to me a son? Well, he was the son when God the Father spoke on the day of Jesus baptizing or being baptized by John in the Jordan River. The Father spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus walked in an innocent way before the Father. And because he walked in an innocent way before the Father, having never committed any sins, when they referred to him as the son of man, they identified him as a real man. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. But because he walked innocent before the Father, that doesn't mean that he could become sin with our sin. He could become sin with our sin when he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. If it be any other way possible, let this cup pass from me. What was he referring to? Was he referring to the crucifixion and the horrible aspects of it? Well, you got to remember this. There were two other people crucified with him. If crucifixion alone was that which he was talking about, what about the other two that were crucified on the same day? Crucifixion in and of itself was an opportunity to have the scripture fulfilled which said, he that hangeth on the tree is cursed. 
And Jesus hung on the tree and he was made a curse with our sins. And when he was made a curse with our sins, he, Jesus, could no longer be looked upon by the Father. So if you want to know why that day turned black, so dark and so black that it was un, not visible for people to really see what was going on. It's like, is there an eclipse or what's going on? Why is it so black? The father could not look upon his son anymore. Oh, you're trying to make something. No, I'm not trying to make anything up. Jesus made the statement on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He didn't say, am I forsaken? It's possible that you're far, you feel far from me. No. He said, why have you forsaken me? Why would he say, why have you forsaken me? That automatically implies that he was forsaken. And he was forsaken. Because he committed sin? No, he didn't commit any sin at all. But he was made sin with our sin. And since he was made sin with our sin by being the lamb that has come to take away the sin of the world, by being made the embodiment of the scapegoat, Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, was separated from the life and the nature of God. And he was taking our place. And therefore, he went to the place where those who have committed sin would go to the place of torment and punishment. How long? Three days and three nights. Now why was it only three days and three nights? Because God had promised, I will not let your soul remain in hell, neither will I allow for your body to see corruption. So Jesus had a promise from the Father, I'm going to pay the price for mankind's sin. I'm going to go to the place that sinners go, and I'm going to suffer for three days and three nights. But I'm going to be raised from the dead. Why? Because my Father has promised me, my body shall not see corruption. We're looking here at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. When the scripture says, and again, I will be to him a father. Why again? Because Jesus was cut off from the life and the nature of the father when he was in hell suffering for our sins. He went where we should have gone. And this is the thing that, that, that really compels me to talk to people about the love of God. Nobody has to go to hell. Nobody. Why? Because Jesus paid the price. Adam sinned. The wages of sin is death. Death was passed upon all men because of Adam's transgression. But Jesus redeemed us with his blood. So why isn't it the way whereby, or we could say it this way, why are people then going to hell if Jesus redeemed us from our sin? Because one must receive salvation by faith. And that faith has to be in Jesus Christ. For the Father is said, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Just that simple. Some people say, well, I don't believe in him. I'm not sure he exists. Well, the Bible says he exists. Yeah, but I don't believe the Bible. Well, there are people that are all around you that say that they have Christ in their heart and they tell you that he exists. Yeah, well, I don't believe them either. Well, let's just do it this way. Why don't you get a plane ticket, go to Israel, and see if the Bible account of, that says he was crucified and how he was crucified and the examination and the place where he was you know, hung on the cross and the place where his body was buried. Why don't you go there and take a look? Because everything the Bible records about his crucifixion literally is there today. See, it's not hard. Either a person's willing to believe the truth or walk away from the truth. 
the person that says Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh, God has made him a liar. Why? You cannot eradicate or erase or destroy the evidence of his coming and the scriptural testimonies given. So if a person says, well, I'm still not going to believe, well, that's because you make a choice. You made a volitional choice not to believe the historical record, the testimony of those that walked with Jesus and those that are now alive around you that are telling you the man is alive and well and he's real in our hearts, then your willingness to reject the testimonies is called unbelief. And unbelievers can't go to heaven because God cannot deny himself. All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Why? There aren't any liars in heaven. See, if a person chooses to deny that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, what are you going to do when you see him? Because you will see him. And the father will ask you, what did you do with my son? Who's where? Seated at his right hand uh, on the throne. So what's a person going to say? Jesus, you are real. Well, I'm glad you confessed it because the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Now, you could have said that when you were on earth breathing air, using your ability to make decisions and say, I admit the truth. Jesus is alive and well. Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. For Jesus said, if you do not believe in me, you shall die in your sins. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. The world was condemned already. But God sent his son so that what? Whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have, but have what? Everlasting life. Now notice this is an upfront deal. Upfront. Now what do you mean upfront? When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you get what we call everlasting life. Another way of saying everlasting life is you get eternal life. When? You get eternal life the moment you call upon him and accept him as your Lord and Savior. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Now, what comes with everlasting or eternal life? You have fellowship with the Father. You have the ability to testify that he dwells within you and your spirit becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost and you have a knowing in your heart God dwells within you and you know that 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 you know. If you were to take your last breath, you know you're going to go to be with your Lord. You know that. Now how do you explain that to people? You just have to tell them. And if the person believes you and trusts you and is willing to say you're a person of character, I believe your testimony, then if he lives in you, he can live in me. What must I do to be saved? Well, if you believe with all your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, if you ask him to come into your heart, you'll be saved. So the person then would have to believe your witness. Your testimony, the testimony of John, the testimony of Paul, and all of the others that testified of Jesus. Now that Jesus Christ is alive and well and seated at the right hand of the Father, our Lord and our Savior wants to rule in the earth realm through his body. We are members of his body. Each one of us comprise up the body of Christ all over the world. Every believer that has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, you have a place and a part in the body of Christ. And we, the body, should be always listening to what? And partic participating in what the head asks us to do. Notice in verse 5 again, of Hebrews chapter 1, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world. Now why does the Bible say first begotten? Again, the first begotten. Well, we know this, that Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh, 
that Jesus Christ is the begotten of the Father. But then when he rose from the dead, he's the first human. Now remember, he set aside his inherent power and glory as being God the Son. But he became the first human to come from spiritual death to spiritual life. The first human. When was death given out? When Adam sinned against God, death passed upon Adam and upon all men. So when we talk about Jesus, he's referred to as the last Adam and the second man. Why was the Bible calling Jesus the second man? Because the first man, Adam, was innocent and had the opportunity of obeying God the Father and should have eaten of the tree of life, but he didn't. He ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And because he was innocent, he had the opportunity to decide whether he would do God's will to become perfected by eating of the tree of life or he could disobey his father and become eternally damned by disobeying God the Father. Well, we already know what Adam did, right? He ate of the tree of the knowledge of sin and death, and thereby sin passed upon all man. Have you ever asked yourself the question, did I do that? <laughs> you ever do something ridiculous and you wonder, what, what was I thinking that I did that? Well, it is because the law of sin and death operates in the earth realm. Well, I don't believe that. Yeah, but even if you don't believe it, you know somebody who has died, and I have news for you. Death passed upon all men, so that's the reason why there are funerals. Death is a spiritual force that has come upon all men. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Jesus Christ died because he was a full-fledged man, but he was willing to die on our behalf. Why? So that he could come to life as the born-again man, the first born-again man. And all of us who believe on him come from spiritual death to spiritual life in him. So that's why the Bible describes, if therefore, if any man be in Christ, if you're in Christ, he is a new creature. You're a new creation. You're a new species. This species did not exist before Jesus rose from the dead. We're literally a born-again species of people who are walking around with physical bodies that are going to change one day, but until then, we're walking around, we're spirit beings inside of a physical body that's getting older. The Bible says our outward man is perishing day, to, day by day, but our inward man is being renewed day by day. So here we are, people who have the eternal life of God dwelling in us, peering out of these eyes that have yet to be changed, but yet we have the mind of Christ which means we think with the capacity like God thinks. So we're born again people. We're sojourners, the Bible describes us. Sojourners mean we're passing through. If anybody loves this world and the things of this world, you need to check up on the fact of what the Holy Ghost is saying. All this is going to burn up. So when people talk about climate change, it's going to be a real climate change, and you can't stop it. It's coming forth. But until then, God has given us life and breath and given us the ability to enjoy life. But you say, well, if I stop breathing, the world's going to be in a better place. I have news for you. <laughs> hey, the world is going to change. It will be folded up as an old garment. And God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. But it won't disturb those who are born again. Why? Because our physical bodies that we currently dwell in is going to be changed like unto Jesus' body, which is a resurrection body. A body that can walk through walls. 
a body that can ascend up into heaven, come back down, a body that can literally tra travel faster than the speed of light and sound. You, you, and you desire, inwardly, you desire to have a body like that. You desire, and that's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it talks about we really do desire to be changed in our physical bodies. It's coming. Until then, every born-again person ought to know how to possess his current vessel and operate in your physical body and allow your body to be an instrument, a living sacrifice that you offer unto God because it's your reasonable service. God wants to move in the earth realm, but he has to move through the body. And we're the body of Christ. So when he says in verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 1, and again when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God. This is God the Father talking to the Son, Jesus and he says, thy throne, O God, God the Father, calling Jesus God, who is God, the second person of the Godhead, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Scepter says that this is what you use to, to, what? to exact judgment. Verse 9, thou hast loved righteousness, and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministers? Or, excuse me, verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? All those who believe on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ say this, I am an heir, am an heir of, salvation. of salvation. I am an heir of God the Father. I'm, I'm a joint heir with Jesus, my Lord. Therefore, the angels of God ought to minister because I'm an heir of salvation. Now, the angels of God that are dispatched to work on your behalf are waiting for you to command them with the word of God. Somebody says, well, why do you choose to live in such a way whereby God is pleased? I choose to live that way because I'm his child. Shouldn't I always do those things that please the Father? Shouldn't you do those things that please the Father? Yes. Really, we have one purpose in life. That is to live to please the Father. And if you work your work, do it as unto the Lord and not unto man. When you open your mouth to speak, you have an audience of the Father listening to you. When you treat people in a loving manner, you're reflecting the character of God, your Father. For God is love. Everyone say this. Love, love. Tells, the tells the truth. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the, way. The, truth the truth and the life. And the There's no other way to the Father but by him. Now let's turn over in our Bibles, please, to the scriptures in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As believers in Christ Jesus, 
we have been given the responsibility to testify of his goodness and of his love. We carry the words of salvation, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We carry the message, the testimony of how to get to be a child of God. So if an individual says, well, I don't believe you, I don't want to hear what you have to say. You're really not rejecting me. You're rejecting him who sent me. And if you hate me, you're really not hating me. You're hating him who sent me. And the Bible informs us, Jesus said, don't you be dis discouraged by that, O believer. Jesus says, remember that they hated me before they hated you. <laughs> I like what Jesus said. Remember that they hated me before they hated you first. This is a John's Gospel, chapter 15 and chapter 16 of John's Gospel. Jesus lets us know. He says, when people talk crazy to you, don't forget, they talk crazy to me first. When people reject your testimony of God, don't forget, they rejected my testimony first. It's interesting that Jesus, who was anointed by God the Father, who went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him, how that when he would heal a person, how a person could open their mouth and twist their lips to say that Jesus was a devil. But then they said there is no devil, but yet they called Jesus a devil. Hmm? That doesn't even make any sense. But that goes to prove that there is a devil. He is a liar and the father of lies, and he's a murderer. And that's the reason why Paul, in the, gospel, in the good news, the letter written to the Galatian believers, he said, I'm just shocked. Who has bewitched you? Who have you been listening to? Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified. You've known that he's been crucified. You accept that. You receive being born again. You receive being filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, are you now having begun in faith and receiving from God? Have you turned away from faith and started going after what other people's emotional feelings are that are out of line with Scripture? Of course the devil lies. That's what a liar does. How do you know when a liar is lying? When his lips are moving, he's a lion. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we have here the instructions to give the communion. So if you don't have communion elements, I'd like for you all, please make sure you raise your hand if you don't have communion elements. The ushers will be glad to pass communion elements to you. We're going to take communion together. I want to thank you for tuning in today's lesson. If you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then I'm going to lead you into a confession of faith. If you say these words after me, you can become a child of the living God. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let us pray these words now believing these words in our heart and saying them with our mouth. Dear God, I believe in my heart you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. He was crucified. His blood was shed to wash me clean. And dear God, you raised him from the dead. So I confess with my mouth now, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. You are alive. I believe this in my heart. And because I confess you as my Lord, I am now a child of the living God. Father, thank you for making me your very own. I will live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to thank you for your continual support of this broadcast of Spirit Food Christian Center. We're so grateful for your participation. I'd like to give you an opportunity to participate by our Push Pay app. Text my SFCC to the number 77977. You'll receive further instruction on how to give. We're so grateful and thankful for your continual support and love. 
Remember, you're helping to make it happen. In Jesus' name, you amen. Are the sun.